Mithra does not belong to the supposed dying and rising group of gods. He is, however, a prominent god used by mythicists in their argument from precedent. Mithras is best known as a god worshipped in the Roman Empire, and particularly favoured by the Roman army from the 1st to the 4th centuries AD. The Roman Mithras was probably derived from an earlier Persian god Mithra of Zoroastrianism, but the degree of continuity between the two is debated. Roman Mithras temples, or Mithri, are usually subterranean or semi-subterranean rooms large enough to accommodate 20 to 30 people, with benches down each side of a central aisle. They have survived in large numbers across Britain and Europe, and consequently, we have numerous archaeological finds about Mithraism, but we have very little surviving text, and none written by Mithraists themselves. That which survives consists mostly of inscriptions. We have literally hundreds of examples of iconic scenes. The principal one appears to be the bull-killing scene, called the Tauroctony, of which over 700 examples exist. Other scenes that are found repeatedly in Mithri show Mithras banqueting with Sol Invictus and being born from a rock. The Tauroctony is always the central scene in Mithri. This scene in particular was specific to Roman Mithraism and was not found in its Persian predecessor. The Tauroctonies have several features in common. Mithras is seen wearing a Phrygian cap and is holding the bull by the nostril with his left hand and stabbing it with his right as he looks over his shoulder to a figure of Sol. A dog and a snake reach up towards the blood. A scorpion is attacking the bull's genitals. A raven is somewhere in the scene. Three ears of wheat come from the bull's tail. There are torch barrels on either side, one with a torch pointing up and one pointing down. The killing takes place in a cave. Occasionally the cave is surrounded by the twelve signs of the zodiac. The sun is located outside of the cave and in some cases a ray of light reaches down to touch Mithras. Second in importance to the Tauroctony scene is a banqueting scene in which Mithras and Sol Invictus dine on bull parts. Another common scene has Mithras being born from a rock. A common icon in Mithra is the lion-headed figure. This is a naked man's body wrapped around with one or two serpents, with the head of a snake resting on the lion's head. The lion's mouth is usually open and the figure has wings, keys and a scepter. The name of this figure is known from inscriptions to be Arimanius, a demonic figure of the Zoroastrian pantheon. Archaeological finds from many Mithraei suggest that many if not most rituals were associated with meals. Eating utensils and food remains, such as animal bones, are often found. Seasonal residues, particularly cherry stones, suggest that there were prominent Mithraic festivals in midsummer. Mithraei have multiple altars underneath the Tauroctony scene, and often others located elsewhere. Burnt animal residue has been found on the main altars indicating animal sacrifice. From other indications we know that prayers were held three times a day, and that Sunday was an especially sacred day. December 25th was a general festival of the sun in ancient Rome. It may also have been the birthday of Mithras, or it may simply be that his worshippers had a Mithraic version of the general solar festival. The origin and spread of Mithras has been the subject of a great deal of scholarly research and debate. Mithra, or Mithras, is mentioned by more than 50 ancient writers of the West, spanning from the 5th century BC to the 6th century AD. From these and archaeological evidence, it is possible to reconstruct a general outline of the god and his cult, but most of this relates to the Roman rather than the Persian cult. The earliest Western mention we have of Mithra is by Herodotus, who tells us in Histories Book 1, Others are accustomed to ascend the hilltops and sacrifice to Zeus, the name they give to the whole expanse of the heavens. Sacrifice is offered also to the sun and moon, to the earth and fire and water and the winds. These alone are from ancient times the objects of their worship, but they have adopted also the practice of sacrifice to Urania, which they have learned from the Assyrians and Arabians. The Assyrians give to Aphrodite the name Mylitta, the Arabians Alilat and the Persians Mitra. Herodotus is unusual but not unique in having Mithra a female. The Persian Mithra was associated with a major festival which was the only occasion when the Persian kings became drunk. Plutarch tells us that the Persian cult had two gods, one good and the other evil, and that Mithra held an intermediate position and was called the mediator. He also says that 
the Persians offered strange sacrifices upon Mount Olympus and performed certain secret rites or religious mysteries, among which those of Mithras have been preserved to our own time, having received their previous institution from them. A further dubious comment from Pseudo-Plutarch says, Near it also, i.e. the Araxes River, is a mountain Diorphus, so-called from the giant of that name, of which this story is told. Mithra, being desirous of a son, hating the female race, entered into a certain rock, and the stone becoming pregnant after the appointed time bore a child named Diorphus. The latter, when he had grown to manhood, challenged Ares to a contest of valour and was slain. The purpose of the gods was then fulfilled in his transformation into the mountain which bears his name. Real Plutarch also tells us that in the 1st century BC, pirates of Cilicia conducted secret rites of Mithra, but it's not clear whether these were the true forebears of the later Roman religion. The same pirates were rounded up by Pompey in 67 BC, and some of them may have been relocated to southern Italy, giving a possible route of introduction of Mithraism into the Roman Empire, but if this is true, there would have to have been a good 150 years during which they left no trace whatsoever. Roman Mithraism appears towards the end of the 1st century AD. A comment in Statius's epic poem Thebaid of around 80 AD says, Whether it please thee to bear the name of a ruddy titan after the manner of the Archimedean race, or Osiris, lord of the crops, or Mithra as beneath the rocks of the Persian cave, he presses back the horns that resist his control. Which is a probable reference to Mithra's bull. The earliest artefacts that definitely originate from the Roman Mithraic cult date from around 75 AD. A small number of Mithraei dating from the last quarter of the 1st century AD have been found, and they are widely scattered across the Roman Empire, making it difficult to say where this cult arose from. There is one Mithraeum in Judea that is located in Caesarea Maritima, that appears to have been built by 80 AD. One theory of the origin of Roman Mithraism that is particularly relevant to Jesus was put forward by David Ulansi in his 1989 book The Origins of the Mithraic Mysteries, Cosmology and Salvation in the Ancient World. This followed the 1980s fashion for astrotheology and focused on deciphering the Tauroctony. Ulansi argued that Roman Mithraism originated in the 1st century BC with a group of Stoic philosophers in Tarsus in Asia Minor, the same city that Paul hailed from. It was a result of the discovery by the astronomer Hipparchus of Rhodes of the precession of the equinoxes. Ulansi theorised that the symbology of the Taurotony is of astrotheological origin and killing the bull signified the passing from the age of Taurus the bull to the age of Ares the ram. But as this supposedly happened around 2000 BC rather than the 1st century, it's a little hard to reconcile and there is no historical evidence that supports this theory directly. The idea of links between Mithras and Jesus owes much to early Christians who complained that Mithraism had copied rites from Christianity with wicked intent. Here's Justin Martyr. For the apostles in the memoirs composed by them, which are called Gospels, have thus delivered unto us what was enjoined upon them, that Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks said, Do ye this in remembrance of me, this is my body, and that after the same manner, Having taken the cup and given thanks, he said, This is my blood, and gave it to them alone, which the wicked devils have imitated in the mysteries of Mithras, commanding the same things to be done. For that bread and cup of water are placed with certain incantations in the mystic rituals of one who is being initiated. You either know or can learn. Then Tertullian has a similar gripe about baptism. For nations destitute of all understanding of spiritual powers attribute the same efficacy to their idols, but they cheat themselves with springs that yield no living water. For in certain rites also of an Isis or Mithra, initiation is by means of baptismal water. A Tertullian has other complaints also. The devil is the inspirer of the heretics, whose work it is to pervert the truth, who with idolatrous mysteries endeavours to imitate the realities of the divine sacraments. Some he himself sprinkles as though in token of faith and loyalty. He promises forgiveness of sins through baptism, and if my memory does not fail me, marks his own soldiers with the sign of Mithra on their foreheads, commemorating an offering of bread, introduces a mock resurrection, and with the sword opens the way to a crown. 
Moreover, has he not forbidden a second marriage to the supreme priest? He maintains also his virgins and his celibates. We get further details of Mithraism from the 3rd century writer Porphyry. Our ancestors appear to have adorned and consecrated grottos and caves, so the Persians also initiate the novice into the mysteries by an allegorical descent of the soul to the lower world and a return, and they use the name cave. In the first instance, according to the report of Eubulus, Zoroaster consecrated a natural cave in the adjacent mountains of Persis, carpeted with grass and with fresh springs, to the honour of Mithra, creator and father of all, an imitation of the world cave which Mithra fashioned, and of the natural elements and regions which bore within at regular intervals symbolic representations. And after Zoroaster, the custom was observed amongst others also of celebrating their rites in grottos and caves, either natural or artificial. Then a 3rd century papyrus currently held in Paris is thought probably to be a Mithrian liturgy. Show me favour, kindly forethought and fortune as I write these ancient mysteries that we have received, and for my only son I beg the gift of immortality. Yea, ministers of this our great potency. You therefore, O daughter, shouldest take the juices of herbs and spices which are in thy care in the right of my holy office. For in this the great sun god Mithra bade me by his archangel take part, that I may rise to heaven and have insight into all things. And of my discourse this is the invocation. O King, greatest of the gods, thou Son, the Lord of heaven and earth, God of gods, thy breath is potent, thy power is potent. If it seem good to thee, forward me on my way to the supreme deity who begat thee and formed thee, for I am the man. So this does give the impression of a salvation God, an idea that's further reinforced by Emperor Julian the Apostate's 4th century account. But to thee, Hermes, declares to us, have I gathered the knowledge of Mithra the father? Do thou therefore observe his commands, providing for thyself in this life a sure cable and anchorage, and with a joyous confidence assuring for thyself when thou departest hence the gracious guidance of the god. The popularity of Mithraism reached its peak in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. It began to decline by the end of the 3rd century and rapidly declined in the 4th century because of opposition from Christianity and finally the anti-pagan decrees of Emperor Theodosius during the 390s AD. So in the round we have two distinct Mithraic cults with an uncertain connection between them. We know little about the Persian cult. With the Roman cult we have Jesus and Mithra born on 25th of December. We have the common idea of a meal of bread and a drink, wine in Christianity, water in Mithraism, though it's not clear if the Mithraic version was sacramental. We have something akin to baptism in Mithraism, and we have some evidence of Mithras being a saviour figure of sorts. So there is a potential for influence on Christianity from Roman Mithraism, but neither historicist nor mythicist would deny this. Mithras gives us little that can help to discriminate between mythicism and historicity. There is one suspect reference to the resurrection, which is in the context of Justin Martyr complaining that Mithraism has copied Christianity, which may have been true, and this stands at odds with other evidence about Mithras, specifically that he did not die. The mythicists respond to this by trying to improve on the similarities. One approach is to argue that Mithras was actually born of a virgin. This is argued by leading mythicist the late D.M. Murdoch. It's complicated, but one idea is that being born of a rock was symbolic of being born of Mother Earth, and Mother Earth was seen as being a virgin. Another idea makes a link to a supposed Indian version of Mithra who was born of Aditi, the mother of the gods, also referred to as the inviolable or virgin dawn. The link to India is particularly suspect, as if accepted it gives immediate access to a rich seam of ancient mythology to mine for parallels with Jesus. The link is, of course, speculative. Another tack taken by mythicists is to broaden the category of dying gods to gods who suffer a passion. In this way, Mithras' struggle with and overcoming of the bull can be classified in the same group as Jesus' struggle with and overcoming of death. Then, the twelve signs of the zodiac that occasionally appear around the Tauroctony in Mithrae are equated with the disciples of Jesus, another stretch. 
It is possible that the twelve disciples had their ultimate origin in the astrotheological signs of the zodiac, but if so, and if Jesus was mythical, it's still more likely that the twelve disciple idea came from the twelve tribes of Israel, rather than directly from anything connected with a non-Judaic religion. The problem with these arguments is not with their internal consistency, but one connected with statistics and probability, a field that is generally poorly understood by scholars. The problem is that if the criteria for similarity can be loosened in this way, then the number of gods who are similar to Jesus is going to be expanded considerably by random chance, and therefore any similarities we do find are much less likely to be causally linked to Jesus. I think it's fairly clear to most observers that particularly these last three rationalisations of similarity between Mithras and Jesus were motivated by a belief in mythicism, rather than by an attempt to objectively assess the truth. Turning to the circumstantial evidence connecting Mithraism and Christianity, this is good. We have a Mithraeum functioning in Caesarea in 80 AD, and it's likely that the initiation of the cult in the area predated the archaeology by a generation or so. So we have Mithraeism getting going in Caesarea at the same time as the Gospels were being written. Then there is the dubious but possible connection with Tarsus from the 1st century BC leading to a possible influence on Paul. Both religions were important, particularly in the Roman military. Furthermore, Mithraei abruptly disappear from the archaeological record during the 4th century, the same century in which Christian churches abruptly appear, built on the site of or over earlier Mithraei in many cases, raising the distinct possibility that the people who started worshipping in Christian churches were the same as those who had recently stopped worshipping in Mithraei. This means that if Mithraism is true... Mithraism could potentially have influenced Christianity at the time that historicity was gaining the upper hand over an early mythicist belief, but there is no evidence as to how or why. So the case for Mithras is one of the best for a Jesus precedent, but there is a problem with historicity. And that is that despite the many possible connections, there is no suggestion in Mithraism of anything related to a specifically historical Jesus. There is no God-man with an earthly ministry of any kind, and so no hint as to how Mithraism could have contributed to the historicisation of a prior mythical Jesus. Further, any suggestion that Mithraism gives evidence that there was a prehistoricist mythical Jesus is a stretch too far. With so little evidence about the nature of Mithras and the nature of any putative prehistoricist Jesus, linking the two is a flight of pure speculation. So there are similarities between early Christianity and Mithraism, which may be explained by influence passing between the two religions, but more likely that Mithraism and Christianity were influenced by factors external to both, such as Sunday worship and being born on December 25th coming to both from Sol Invictus. These similarities, however, do not help to distinguish between mythicism and historicity. What is apparent is that mythicists have transparently over their case. It doesn't mean that they are wrong, as arguments should be judged on their merits rather than who's making them, but it does undermine the credibility of several mythicists.